a couple of minutes. We're just, just going to get make sure that everybody's online before we start. So if you'll be patient with us for a minute or two, uh, we'll get going. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Terry Andrus, President and CEO of CompleteRx, and I want to personally welcome you to the CompleteRx Thinking Pharmacy Knowledge Series. Today, our webinar will focus on how hospitals and health systems should prepare for and manage rising drug costs. We'll also focus on the impact that rising drug costs have on both patients and hospital financials. For more information on CompleteRx, along with additional articles, white papers, webinars, and events, please visit the CompleteRx website at www.completerx.com. During the webinar, all participant calls will be muted. However, you can submit questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A feature located on your screen's toolbar. We will answer all submitted questions at the conclusion of the presentation. To make this process even more interactive, we'll be asking poll questions throughout the presentation, and we strongly encourage everyone to participate. Now that I have all of the logistics out of the way, let me introduce you to our speaker, Ms. Julie Rubin. Julie is currently the Director of Clinical Services for CompleteRx, advising our entire cadre of cl clinicians throughout the country. Julie has more than 20 years of clinical pharmacy experience and she is board certified in pharmacotherapy. Julie brings a wealth of clinical knowledge to our webinar today, and it's my pleasure to turn the presentation over to Julie. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Julie Rubin. Thank you, Terry. By the end of the, our discussion, I hope you will have a better understanding of the key drivers behind the increased spending on pharmaceuticals. I hope to give insight to the impact on patients, hospitals, and assistants proposed regulations, and finally, how hospitals can combat rising prices. Prior to our discussion, I would like to survey the audience to see what you feel are the primary drivers behind drug costs. As you can see, the audience felt that the lack of price control was the biggest contributor to rising prices. Now let's take a closer look. We began our talk by investigating several drivers behind the increased spending on pharmaceuticals. Before we understand where the prices are going, we need to understand some prior background. The development of an effective pharmaceuticals has transformed medical care offering treatment for acute and chronic illnesses. Some of the prior pharmaceuticals prevent cure and illness, especially those historically resulted in premature death and disability, like our antibiotics and vaccines. Most pharmaceuticals now focus on alleviating the symptoms and side effects of chronic diseases. The U.S. has been the leader in the development of new pharmaceuticals and in the industry is one of the nation's most successful private sector of units U.S. economy. As a result, drug spending as a percent of overall health spending has increased from 10% in 2005 to now 12% in 2016. Spending on drugs rose from $216 billion in 20, 2006 to close to $500 billion in 2016, more than three-fold increase in real dollars. 
the growth is projected to continue to increase and double every five years. As a result, by 2020, it is expected to reach in excess of $500 billion. In the past, specialty items only accounted for less than 30%. Now it accounts for more than 50% of the actual spending. Specialty items include those, those oncology agents, autoimmune, viral hepatitis, multiple sclerosis, and the HIV antiretrovirals. The rise in price can be seen throughout the market, and it's not only in brand items. Drug prices have increased more than the inflation rate. For the last three years, we have seen double-digit price increases. Branded products rose approximately 9%, while items still on patent rose approximately 15%. On the other hand, generic medications account for approximately 80% of all U.S. prescriptions. Historically, they tended to be cheaper and achieved, achieved larger discounts than branded items. But due to the lack of competition and fewer generics being available, we are even seeing generic prices increase, and they're increasing by about 3%. While it is clear that prices are rising for all medications, it is unclear to most Americans why are they increasing. Researchers have identified several reasons they believe that they are driving prices up. During the next three slides, we will investigate these items more closely and their impacts on prices. Among some of the reasons that are not listed above include shortages in raw material and fewer generic medications being available. The growth of prescription drugs has resulted in an explosion of polypharmacy that often causes a negative health care outcome. The rise of prescription co drug costs is a significant factor and the rise of overall health care costs in the U.S. People are frequently over-medicated and take lots of drugs at once. Nearly 40% of adults aged 65 and older use more than five more medications at a time, and 80% resulted in at least one prescription medication. Adverse drug events account for 3.5 million physician office visits and an estimated 1 million emergency department visits annually. Now in the midst of this current economic crisis, American consumers are trying to get fewer prescription drugs for the first time in the last decade. Physicians and pharmacists are working together to be, review all the medications and focusing on quality, discontinuing medications that are ineffective and no longer needed. Not only does polypharmacy allow for prices to increase, but the fact that the U.S. does not regulate prices has also allowed the prices to increase. The question is, should government set a minimum or a price floor, or a maximum called a price ceiling, to be charged for products of service? Many feel that this would hinder innovation, stifle competition, and stall investment. By cutting prices by 40 to 50 percent, it would lead to a 30 to 60 reduction in medications in development. It would ultimately reduce the amount of money pharmaceutical companies must spend on new medicines. So what is the solution to this problem? Well, 11 countries have already set pricing controls, and their patent medications are already less than 18 to 67% below our prices in the United States. Others feel that we should streamline the process that FDA approves medications. Lastly, we may, need provide, we may need to provide financial incentives for the development of new medications. Our drug patents last longer than other drug patents in other countries. According to the Boston Globe, it costs approximately $2.6 billion to develop a new drug. Drug patents prevent competition and form a monopoly on their medications for up to and lasting approximately 20 years. Their markers tend to increase the price every year for about 5% or more, and it tends to be increased more toward the end of patent in order to recover some of the drug development. Patents create access problems and allow for companies to misrepresent safety and efficacy of their drugs to maximize sales. Companies only reveal information necessary to gain patents. We are all looking for a solution to this long-term problems with patents. We can look at other countries to see what they have done 
India is a great example of a country with a better plan for their patients. Gleevec, a common cancer drug here in the States, costs about $84,000. But in India, that same drug costs only $1,000. Patents were only offered for manufacturing processes, not for pharmaceutical products. And patents last only five years compared to our 20 years. And they also were to protect patients. The limited ability of companies to get patents for new versions of drugs whose active ingredients were previously known unless they can show significant therapeutic benefits. Older generics were priced too low, forcing drug makers to stop making them. When generics first come out, we'd like to see about a 15 to 20 percent discount. And you need approximately five to ten companies actually making that product to sustain that type of competition. Competition has actually decreased over the last few years, causing the prices to increase. For example, over the last year, media has focused on several different companies and what has happened to their prices. For example, isopril, a common cardiovascular medication, because of the monopoly, has increased its price by 500%. Nitroprusside, another cardiovascular med, price has increased by 200%. And finally, one of the most heavily um, meds that's been in media recently, Darapin, used for toxoplasmosis, toxoplasmosis and HIV, has increased by 5,000%. Another reason, besides limited competition that causes a generic price to rise, is because of the DESI um, drugs, or drug efficacy study implementation. The DESI program was established in the 1960s by the FDA to help classify all pre-1962 drugs that were already on the market as either effective, ineffective, or needing further studies. By 1984, final action had been completed on approximately 3,000 products. Of these, 2,000 were considered effective and can continue marketing. 1,000 were found not to be effective, and about 100 were still pending. In order to be continued, they had to provide market research to show that they are effective in all studies. This allowed these medications to go on patent for about five years and to price their medication um, based on what they wanted. Clonidine is a great example of this. It used to cost pennies, and now its price is priced at $5 per tap. Limited competition, as discussed before, is heavily due to mergers and acquisitions in the pharmaceutical industry. In 2014, there was a spike in big mergers and acquisitions that occurred, including one of the biggest, Activists Acquiring Forest Laboratories. More recently, in 2015, was set to have the largest merger ever with Pfizer and Allergen, merging in an all-stock deal valued about $160 billion. However, this has not been finalized as the U.S. Treasury proposed new rules to limit tax inversions, which would make, make it harder for the companies to realize larger financial gains. Academic researchers and public and private institutions frequently spearhead the development of new drugs with federal funding from the National Institute of Health, or NIH. Although tax dollars support this research, discoveries are increasing sold to private industry for development and profit. Our results show that NIH funding spurs the development of private sector patents. A $10 million boost in NIH funding leads to a net increase of 2.3 new patents. Many companies join to help push compounds until they can be studied into clinical research. Drug advertising now approaches $3 billion per year for consumer promotions alone. Pharmaceutical companies spend 2.5 times more on marketing and advertising than on research and development. The industry is thought to that it actually helps educating patients about medications, treatment options, and side effects, that it prompts a dialogue between providers and patients and improves the appropriateness of prescribing and improves compliance. Their opponents like to argue that it increased the cost by promoting requests for branded name products and promotes newer, more expensive prescriptions, often with higher profit margins. As a result, AMA, American Medical Association, calls for a ban on direct-to-consumer advertising for prescription drugs 
and medical devices. The United States and New Zealand are the only two countries in the world that allow direct-to-consumer advertising on prescription drugs. Advertising dollars spent by drug markers have increased by 30% in the last two years to $4.5 billion, according to the market research. As the prices continue to increase, we need to be aware of its impact on the end user and our patients. One white paper asked patients and business owners about the influence on increased prices on their patient and their business. As a re result of these increased prices, the patients often had higher co-pays, which lead to more spending. They became irate, had to go to their physicians, and hopefully ask for alternatives. When there wasn't an alternative, these patients had to make a conscious decisions to either pay for the prescription, and a lot of those patients, when paid, tried to skip, skip and actually become non-compliant in order to make those prescriptions last longer. It's also resulted in people not retiring on time in order to maintain insurance and also put off necessary medical um, care. So what are patients do, especially if they have a rare disease or rare condition? Orphan drugs were created as a solution. An orphan drug is a pharmaceutical agent that has been de developed specifically to treat a rare medical condition. The condition itself being referred to as an orphan disease. Of uh, the 41 novel new drugs approved by the FDA in calendar year 2014, 41% of the orphan drugs from the highest annual total since passage of the Orphan Drug Act. So some orphan drugs have reached blockbuster status, meaning that their sales have been more than one billion in the year. Example of these orphan drugs include drugs that we treat cystic fibrosis, inhaled tobramycin, and even palmazine. Orphan drugs can set their prices on a case-by-case -case basis and on three different models value added, cost plus, and comparable value. Because, but because supply and demand, there are fewer people with the disease, it also dries up the cost. Health insurers continue to actually pay because it's medical necessity. There are many solutions to this growing problem. Genzyme offers 3% of its patients free drugs. There's also a national organization that actually is focused on reaching as many patients as they can with these rare diseases and rare drugs. Oncology patients are another subset that have been struggling for some time. As you can see for this, from this chart, the, most, the monthly cost for medications have increased dramatically. For example, Eurovoy is an outlier costing approximately 40000 per month at initiation. These monthly prices have led many discussion whether cancer medication, medications cross the line between from having a reasonable profit to being profit curing. There are many myths to this reason. It was thought that a, a cancer drug going to market costs about $1 billion, but on, in research it's less than that. It's about 10% less. They also thought the prices are due because of the benefit to the patient. Oh, there's, there's no correlation between cost and benefit. With a typical out-of-pocket being about 20 to 30 percent, the burden is about 20 to 30,000 per year, nearly half the average income. At this high prices, 20 to 30 percent of patients skip or compromise therapy. Before we get to what hospitals can do to combat prices, we want to know how drug prices have affected your hospital specifically. Please know you can select more than one answer.
As you can see, many feel that implementing formulary changes will make a big impact on helping hospitals combat these rising prices. Let's take a look and see what other options hospitals and health systems have to do. Biosimilars is a new um, thing that actually is helping the market. Many are placing their hopes in these agents and will consider these to be the generics in the future. High unit costs for biologics, meaning the EPOs and the Nupigen, has resulted in patients' concerns about continued access to potentially effective therapies. Recently, many of these have expired. Their patents have expired um, and ushered an era of subsequent production of biologics and biosimilar products. Bio, biosimilar drugs would have the same effect in the body as the original bi biologic drug. Drugs may sell from anywhere between 30 to 50 percent less than the branded name price. Some examples include Xeroxo and Granix, Infliximab, which has been recently approved, and we're expecting new lots within the next year. Pharmacy may also work proactively to help control costs. Hospitals can bid for better pricing based on utilization with their GPO and manufacturers. An example that we have done within Complete Our Access is we worked with Medicure Pharma to obtain a contract for better pricing when we switched from Integralin to Tyrofibin. Once attained a certain threshold, we were offered better pricing for a period of time. Another way the Department of Pharmacy can be proactive is by creating therapeutic interchanges, protocols, and or policies to curb prescribing. There's approximately eight to nine statins available on the market. Um, and in order to control costs in inventory, we, the hospital, we are a hospital, would choose a preferred agent and switch patients while being in the hospital to that agent. The Department of Pharmacy will also work with risk and other committees to design protocols to assist with preventing readmissions. We also ensure that patients are on appropriate therapy and meet certain guidelines. Many hospitals have adopt, adopted meds to bed and transitions of care programs to assist with these prevent, preventions of readmissions. Another aspect of formulary man, management is to ensuring that the hospital is getting reimbursed for outpatient services or routing patients, if possible, to the outpatient world. We also should confirm reimbursement and charges for those high drugs that they're getting on the outpatient side. Ensuring that your hospital is doing everything to maximize reimbursement, which means that pharmacy must be physically involved with patient care. We can work collaboratively to review the charge master and JCOs, and as it may change routinely, and if not updated, we can miss charges. Later in this session, we will talk about several other ways that we can help maximize hospital reimbursement, examples being 340B patient assistance programs and actually value-based purchasing. Programs, 340B program was established for discounting of outpatient medications. Hospital receives a 20 to 50 percent discount for drugs when they participate in 340B. The estimated savings in 2013 when they participate is approximately $3 billion. In order to help, we must first begin focusing on compliance, whether they're using the correct NDC drug for, or drug cost, and we also may need to look at technology. Are we using the appropriate programs to help us ensure that we're doing 340B correctly, microhelix or palace, for example. Two out of every three visits to the doctor will end up with a prescription being written. Nearly 3.4 billion prescriptions were fulfilled in the United States in, 20, in 2005. More than 46 million Americans do not have health insurance and millions more are underinsured. Eight out of 10 are uninsured people that are working in working families. Among those with health insurance, one out of 10 individuals 65 years, years and older 
one out of three persons 55 years have, do not have prescription drug coverage. Patient assistance programs were designed to help patients who lack health insurance or prescription drug coverage obtain medications that they desperately need. Patient assistance programs are offered by pharmaceutical companies to provide free or low-cost prescription drugs to qualifying individuals. Most programs require the applicant have limited or no prescription drug coverage from a private or public source, a de demonstrated financial need based on set income and asset limitations and proof of U.S. residency. Here are a few useful resources for patient access and indigent programs. Value-based purchasing was established in 2010. Outlined above are the dates that were important in rolling this program out. As you can see, there are three areas that CMS is focusing on improving reimbursement. The first is the dark blue, which is the value-based purchasing program, which was in effect from 2013 to 2017. As you can see, the green bar, or readmission program, began in about 2013 and didn't reach its biggest percentage reimbursement until 2017. And finally, the newest measure that began in 2015 is looking at healthcare-associated conditions. From readmission, readmission reduction program was looked at, started in about 2013, as previously stated. In 2013, it focused on AMI, acute myocardial infarction, pneumonia, and heart failure. Beginning in 2015, it's expanded its use to COPD, total hip replacement, and total knee replacement. As the program grew, we started looking at health-acquired conditions reduction program, or looking at those infections that are acquired while the patient is in the hospital, being a DVT or some type of infection. In tandem, the value-based program, top 25% of HAC rates will receive 1% reduction in their overall Medicare reimbursement rate. It is imperative for hospitals to work collaboratively to look at managing costs to reimbursement. We will need to look at transitions of care, medication reconciliation. Um, care will begin focusing on those chronic diseases. We need to ensure that we continue appropriate cost-effective medications and keep them out of the hospital and keep the patients out of the hospitals. Many various therapies, like the dialysis, are becoming bundled. As a result, if we continue to use more costly items, it will exceed the threshold in fees. Besides reimbursement, many states are already looking at ways that they can regulate, look at regulations to fix or control cost. California is one of the first. Um, it's on the November 2016 ballot. It requires companies to report any move to increase the list price of medicines by more than 10% during a 12-month period. Drug makers would need to justify price hikes for medicines with a list price of more than 10000 within 30 days of posting. Why is this important? Because over 900 medications are listed higher than $10,000. Massachusetts is another state that has actually looked at um, drug costs. Drug makers, drug makers need to disclose costs and general pricing data. States can impose certain price controls. New York is another that its governor is included in similar language in a bill in the future. There are many other ways that we can begin to speak up against cost issues and other health care issues. Ensure access and advocate for standardization of pharmacy benefit programs. Promote quality medication management, but ensure that unneeded and ineffective medications are eliminated. Advocate for comprehensive health information through better health IT and health internet. For policies that ensure scientific rigor, strict attention to conflict of interest, 
and ensure firewalls bill that would require state drug companies to publicly disclose payments to physicians. The law program to support academic detail into the promotion of brand names and off-label use. All right, before we kick off our Q&A session, uh, we want to thank you all for your participation in our webinar today. A link to download this presentation along with the audio recording will be emailed out to all attendees uh, after the webinar. And the webinar will also be uploaded to the Knowledge Series section of the CompleteRx website where you can download it at your convenience. Now we'll open it up uh, for questions. All right, we got a question in. How much can hospitals look to save by implementing any of the tactics discussed? Well, when we look at 340B savings, um, just as an example, in the past, ComplateRx has actually had some opportunities for 340B. And in one hospital, we saved approximately $2 million. Um, if you look at another example, it's J-Code modifiers. And another place that we had this, when we looked at the charge master and also all its information, we looked at a revenue, our revenue increasing by about 62% in that one example when we looked at J-Codes. Okay, we've got another question in. Um, can you explain more about the different pricing models that it can affect orphan drug prices? Yeah, as previously said, there were three different ways that prices can actually be controlled for rare drug diseases. Value added is the first. It is based on replacement or enhancement of current treatments in the same category. Cost plus is the second example, and just as it implies, it's pricing based on the development of cost and the return to investment for new products can actually be um, built. And finally, comparable costs, it's a pricing that compares the characteristics or benefits of the drug in different clinical categories. All right, we've got another question. Is one of the reasons that other companies can pay less for medications because the U.S. is subsidizing the cost of those medications with higher prices? And if so, are there any efforts underway to address this issue? Um, I don't necessarily think so. I think that um, the higher prices, I think, resulted from a lot of the discussion that we had previous. It's, um, they think that they're trying to recoup the information for research and development, but they're also offsetting it for the fact that there might be limited competition or and or um, needing because it's either a rare disease and or other factors that might have led for those high prices. Okay, uh, another question, are there specific areas within the hospital that should be reviewed first to keep costs under control? Yes, I would focus on some of those outpatient areas, for example, oncology, cath lab, any of those places where they do a lot of your outpatient surgery is another great example. Where the infusion centers would be my last example. Any of those places that they have some of those out outpatient medications where reimbursement may make a on whether we should provide service or not service. Okay, we've got another question that's kind of similar to the last. It says, when looking to combat rising drug prices, where should the hospital start first? Um, 
as I had previously, there's many places that you can start first. The other thing that I may even look at first, even before that, and it comes back to the reimbursement. I might look at your charge master, look at your utilization to focus on what areas your hospital actually focuses in. If you guys do not have a um, outpatient infusion center and or oncology or cath lab, there might be something else that's driving your hospital's spend. So it's important to look at first the utilization to see where you're spending your most dollars. And then I might even delve into the charge master to see if the J codes, the multipliers, and so forth were actually set up right. So those are some of your easier first steps prior to looking at some of the other ones. All right, guys, since we don't have any additional questions, uh, we'll end the webinar. Wait a minute, we've got another one. <laughs> Hang on just a second. With the number of costly specialty drugs increasing, how does this impact reimbursement and what should be done? That's a really good question. I think that we need to actually be looking at it. Um, what we need to do is actually look at, I think reimbursement should be the, one of the first things that we look at to see how patients, or is this a service that we want to provide at this hospital? to see how we can actually provide the service either at a better or more cost effective. Is there a second line agent or a third line agent that provides equal care? Like I had said previously in the oncology world, the best price may not be the best service. Some of the medications that have been around for longest still work just equally as well. Um, so we may need to start looking at therapy, what's out there. Um, do we need that biggest and brightest drug? All right, um, unless there's another question that pops in before, what we're going to do is end the webinar early. I'd again like to thank everybody for their participation. If you do have questions or you'd like to follow up with us, please get on the CompleteRx website and contact us, and we'd be more than happy to speak with you. Thanks, everyone, for joining, and have a fabulous afternoon.